My name is Wei Tai. I'm a solutions architect in the network programmability team at Cisco. I have been working with CompD and NSO since 2010. I've also been supporting network equipment vendors with validating their NetConf implementation through our NetConf and Yang automation testing program. The title of my session is Migration from CLINet to NetConfNet. Here's the agenda. I'll first go over the NSO Net architecture. I'll give an introduction on how CLI and NetConf Nets are built. I'll compare the benefits of NetConf versus CLI Nets. I'll then go over the migration procedure for going from a CLI Net to NetConf Net for an existing service application. I'll conclude by showing two demos in separate recordings. The first one showing the net migration using a pre-built iOS XR NetConf Net, followed by a second one using a built your own iOS XR NetConf Net. Here's a diagram on the NSO Net architecture. Net, which stands for Network Element Driver, is the adaptation layer that allows the device manager in NSO to speak various different southbound interfaces to communicate with different types of devices in your network. With NetConfNet, there's no Yang modeling or Java coding necessary for the device to be managed by NSO through the device manager. On the other hand, with Cisco style CLI net, SNMP net, or generic net, you have to first write Yang models for them and then write Java code in order for the devices to be manageable by NSO. By far, Cisco style CLI nets have been the most widely deployed with NetConf implementation becoming more popular and more common it is now time to switch to NetConf Nets to take full advantage of all the benefits that NetConf provides. CLI Nets, so Yang models written with annotations to produce the Cisco-like CLI for the managed device. You then develop Java code to allow NSO to communicate properly with the device using the annotated Yang model. You usually only pick out a subset of the CLI commands supported by the device for the use cases specific to your NSO service application. CLI nets are developed and maintained by Cisco. To develop NetConf nets, the YAM models themselves come directly from the device vendor or from the devices themselves. There's no need to create Yang models or write Java code. Specific use cases for your NSO service application are then validated. Network equipment vendors can validate their NetConf implementation using Cisco's NetConf and Yang automation testing program. I've included a link if you're interested to find out more information about this program at the bottom of the slide. You can use pre-built or build your own NetConf Nets. Let's compare the benefits of NetConf versus CLI Nets. First, let's start with reliability. So NetConf supports two or three-phase commits. In the case of three-phase commits, meaning the network-wide transaction, when a set of configuration changes that need to be pushed out to multiple devices in the network using the confirmed commit capability of NetConf, the NetConf protocol would ensure that the entire transaction would either all succeed or if any failure that happened, the entire transaction would be rolled back in all of those devices in the network. This implies that the network will always 
remain in a consistent state. CLINS use only transaction emulation. Next, there's testability. NetConf allows systematic testing, meaning that testing of NetConf implementations can be easily automated. On the other hand, CLI and Nets are very hard to test. You have to retest for even minor changes. Then there's performance. NetConf is optimized for machines, which performs much better than CLI, which is optimized for human operators. Then there's service integration. NetConf is based on standard YAN models. So any service to device mapping that has been done once for one type of vendor's devices can be reused for other vendor's devices. Each CLI net produces a proprietary model, which results in different service mapping that cannot be reused. Lastly, there's the cost, time to market, and coverage category. NetConf Net covers all device features in day one with zero code. While CLI Net is use case driven, that is developed on demand. I've just shown you all the benefits of NetConf Net. Let's now look at how to migrate from a CLI Net to a NetConf Net for an existing service application. So the first step is you select a CLI-based device that supports NetConf. You then upgrade the CLI net and the software of the selected device. Then you install a NetConf net, either pre-built or build your own for the selected device. The CLI net should be compatible with the NetConf net at this point for your service application use case, because you want to be able to push CLI configs to the device using the CLI net and use NSO's compare config command to identify the XML payload diffs through NetConf for the same config change. You then extend the service template that has been used for the existing service application to cover the NetConf interface of the device. And the step here is actually rather easy because you can use the same variables that are already being used by the CLI template of your service application in order to parameterize the NetConf template. What I have found is that change to Java code is usually not required, even for those service applications that have Java code written for them. Then the last step is to switch the service to use the NetConf net. As you can see, the migration procedure is rather simple. I'll also show it to you with examples during my demos. This concludes the presentation portion of my talk. Thanks for listening. You can continue to watch my two demos on doing the net migration next. This is the demo portion of my session on migration from CLI net to NetConf net. I'm going to be showing you a basic service example using only service templates. This is the simple MPOS VPN example from NSO distribution that I'll be starting with. I'll be porting the L3 VPN service that's used in the example to use a pre-built iOS XR NetConf Net. I'll extend the service template to support the iOS XR NetConf device type. 
uh, that modify the service to connect one of the provided edge routers to the NetCom device. In the interest of time, I already got NSO running that started on my system. So I'll show you what I have already started. So I made a fresh copy of the simple MPLS VPN example from the NSO distribution. It's a fresh copy. Uh, I started to, uh, to make the project. I did a make clean all. So this created all of the uh, NetSIM devices. I then modified the ncs.com file in order to allow copy and paste operations in uh, ncs underscore coi. I then also copied a couple of different L3 VPN service template files into my, um, my packages directory that would allow me to be able to show you the different steps, the different interim steps of going from the original template to the final template. I've also copied or downloaded two net packages onto my machine. One is the iOS XR COI net version 7.25, and then the other one is the iOS XR NetCom net version 7.0. Then I started the project. So now all of my NetSIM devices have been started. So is the, um, so is NCS. That's also started. So I'm ready to go ahead and, and to run the NCS COI. So first, let's first look at uh, what packages are running. So as you can see from this, I got um, the iOS COI net running, 3.0. And then for iOS XR, I have two flavors of COI net running. One is 3.0, the other one is 7.25. And I also have a NetComp net running for iOS XR, which is the 7.0 version. And then I also have the L3 VPN service package running. So now let's go ahead and connect to the uh, real iOS XR device that I'm going to be uh, talking to. Uh, so before I do that, let me show you the version information of the device that I'm going to be connecting to. So let's do a show version. So I am connected to a Cisco iOS XR device. And it is of the type XR9000, and the version is 7.0.2. So now let's go ahead and I will be connecting to um, both the COI interface as well as the NetCom interface of this iOS XR device. So let's modify the PE2 device, which was connected to uh, NetSIM. It is now connected to this external uh, iOS XR device and using the latest uh, COI net. And I would also like to uh, connect to the NetConf interface of this same device. And the reason I'm doing that, because it's having NSO connections to both the COI and NetConf interface of the same device would allow me to be able to push configs to the device using the service, the, the L3 VPN service that, I, that I've set up. Um, and, and when the configs are being pushed down through COI, I would be able to use the compare config command in order to identify the XML payload that will be required in order to, um, to generate the same config through the NetConf interface. So I've now connected to both the um, COI interface as well as the NetConf interface of the same device. 
But notice that the, the service that I'm about to set up will only connect to the CLI interface of this device. So now up to this point, I haven't yet performed a sync from the device. So let's do that. So this is going to be synchronizing the, all of the Nest SIM devices as well as these two real iOS XR devices. All of their configs will now uh, reside in NSO's data store as well. Then the next step I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be setting up the L3 VPN service as, uh, as described in the README file of the simple VPN, MPLS VPN example. So I've now configured it. Uh, I haven't yet done a commit, but let's go ahead and do a commit dry run just to see what config is going to be pushed down to uh, to the device. I'm particularly interested in PE2. The reason I picked PE2 is because the service uh, touches PE2, right? So that's the one that uh, I would like to be able to generate the, uh, the NetConf uh, template for. So everything uh, looks, looks good. I'll go ahead and hit uh, commit. Okay, so it looks like we're running into an error here. So apparently the, um, the service template that was done using the older version of the CLI net had missed one particular um, parameter called the um, address family. So this particular Uh, configuration is required to be configured at the P BGP level if it's going to be used in the VLF level. So let me let me show you what what is missing. If I go and compare the original L3 VPN service template with what I'm about to change, I've added a um, this block into, uh, into this CLI template. And the reason that you notice the if, else, if uh, block is that I kept the CLI template the same for this 3.0 version of the CLI net. I made a copy and added this address family tag block in the, um, in the template and made it only apply to the 7.25 version of the CLI net. So I'll go ahead and update the L3 VPN service template to this uh, revision. Now if I go back here, let's not commit and do a packages reload. So this will reload the L3 VPN.xml template file that I've just updated. So it loaded successfully. I'll go back into config. And this time, let's we attempt it. If I do a commit dry run, I'll show you the additional changes that would happen. This is what I've added to my service template for the BJP container. I can do a commit now. So now at this point, the service, this L3 VPN service called Volvo, is connected or is modifying only the CLI interface of PE2. So the PE2-NC that I've just added is only connected 
it, 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 the, its configuration contents has not been updated or has not been synchronized in NSO because it's not part of the service. So I can take advantage of that and use the config command, uh, compare config, not, not config, use the compare config command and generate the XML payload for the NetConf interface. So what this will give me is will be the exact NetConf payload that I should be applying to the device if I were to make the same config change through NetConf. So in order to sort of illustrate to you the process for coming up with the NetConf template for this, for this service template, let me show it to you with the different uh, files side by side. So first, on the left-hand side, on the very left-hand side, I have the raw config payload that I just, just showed you, right? The one that I use the compare config command to generate. So that, that would be what, where I'm starting from in order to get to the final NetConf template. The middle portion is the final NetConf template that I already modified. And then on the very right-hand side, this is the original L3 VPN service, uh, which has the CLI template. And it already has all of the variables all put into place, so I can take advantage of that and use the same variables that are being used for the CLI templates and applied it to the NetConf template. So what I would do would it be, I would start going down through, well, I start with uh, interface configuration. I will look to see which ones are the hard-coded values, right? So if I see here, the interface number is certainly hard-coded here. So I would want to replace it in the NetConf template with the variable. Then I would look for it in the um, in the interface section of the CLI template, and then I'll see um, interface number. And in here, I just added the, the link as part of the uh, the same variable. Here, they have to do loop through it in order to do a for each link. But over here, with the netconf portion, that the list instances allow me to be able to create and delete those instances, so I don't need to. Uh, to loop through the, uh, the list um, with the merge capability, the service template logic will automatically loop through multiple instances. So because of that, as you can see from uh, the raw config data, there are actually two list instances of the interface configuration that showed up here. But when I, when I generate the NetConf template, I only need one of them to be, to be shown here. As I mentioned, because of the merge capability that's happening, every time you run into a uh, additional instance, it would just automatically look through the same uh, the same plan template and populate the other instances. And then you would I would just go through the uh, the rest of the high coded values. So in here, I would see the um, the service name of OVO, and then I would come and take a look um, over here and see that the name should be a string name, and then I'll do the same here. And then I see the IP address here, IP address here, and then the IP address here. So this is sort of the process that you would go through. And then the other thing to watch out for would be the context node. So if you are not certain whether you should be using exactly the same variable at the context node level, the same as the CLI template on your NetConf template, you can use the debug template um, feature of NSO in order to look to see every time it goes through your service template and see what that context node is. So in this case, there are a couple of places that I do have to update it because of different location of the service template and how it relates to the, uh, to the service configuration. So that, that is the process for updating the, um, 
the NetCamp template. So now that I've gone through that, so now when you are done with the um, with the config, I will go ahead and and perform a first perform a diff. I've made a final version. So this is the NetCamp template that I'm going to be adding to the L3 VPN XML file. So now when I go over here, I will uh, do a packages reload. So it loaded successfully, meaning that, uh, well, at least I didn't make any syntactical error in my service template. So certainly while you're doing it, you may have to do a couple of iterations to be sure that everything is done right. So the first step I'm going to be doing is to, uh, to first, let's first undeploy the service. That way, the PE2 node will start fresh with an unconfigured uh, state. Then the next thing I'm going to be doing is reconfiguring PE2 to point to the NetConf interface. Then after that, I do a sync from. If I now do a L3 VPN global check sync, well, it would tell me that it's not synchronized, right? Because we haven't yet pushed the, um, the config down to the device. Then let's do a redeploy and a dry run. Let's take a look and see what will be pushed down to the device. So this time, let's, let's again just focus on, on PE2, right? So with the NetConf template, the variable name, well, the, um, the leaf node names or the XML tag names are a little bit different if you compare that with the CLI template, but it matches the NetConf template that we just, uh, we just did. Then with that, when you're happy with uh, the config that will be pushed onto the device, let's go ahead and, and we deploy it. And just to be sure that you can perform both deploy and undeploy, you would do that to make sure that it's, uh, it, it would complete uh, successfully. So now that, that completes the whole migration process. It, uh, it's really not, uh, not at all difficult. So thank you for, uh, for watching the demo. There, I have one more demo planned, uh, demo number two, that you can, uh, you can watch next. This is the second demo of my session for migration from CLINet to NetConfNet. This is a slightly more advanced service example, which makes use of both Java code and service templates. This is based on the MPLS VPN example from NSO distribution. I'll be extending this example to build your own NetConf Net for a Cisco XRV 9000 router. And I'll be porting the two L3 VPN services that were used in the example to use my own iOS XR NetConf Net, and I'll extend the service templates to support the iOS XR NetConf device type, and then I'll modify the services to connect one of the PEs to the NetConf device in order to complete the, uh, the migration.
I already have NSO running on my system, so to save some time. So I already arranged the, um, the demo in to run in such a way that uh, it would get to uh, where I want to demonstrate to you the, uh, the migration procedure. Um, so I have NSO 5.3.1.1 running on my system, and I've made a fresh copy of the MPLS VPN example. I've updated the um, CLI net for iOS 6R to version 7.25. I ran uh, make clean all in order to start up or to create all of the NetSIM devices and their initial data. Um, I've modified the ncs.com file in order to allow the um, copy and paste operations to be performed through NCS CLI sessions. And I've also copied a couple of different revisions of the layer3vpn-pe.xml files to allow me to show you the interim steps of going from the original surface template file to the final one that fully supports the NetConf template. Uh, and then as I have done in the previous example uh, that I've uncovered some missing configuration that needs to be done to the real iOS XR router that I'm going to be connecting to. So I've gone ahead to take care of that as well, the, uh, the address family uh, setup parameters that needs to be configured at the PGP uh, router level before it can be used within a VLF setting. Um, so given that, so I am running with a slightly modified version of the L3 VPN uh, service. I uh, ran make start, and I did a sync from for all of the devices. So now NSO has a fresh copy of all of the configuration parameters that are stored on all of the NetSIM devices. And I've also configured the two L3 VPN services called Volvo and Ford uh, that were shown in the README file of the example. And uh, I did dry run just to see what sort of parameters are getting pushed out onto the uh, devices. And I'm particularly interested in PE0 because that is the one that I have selected to, uh, to allow me to connect into a um, real iOS XR device for both the CLI interface as well as the NetConf interface, which I will be using to do the, um, the net migration. So we'll be uh, looking at the configs of PE0 quite a bit. And then uh, repeat, repeated the same process for the second L3 VPN service called Ford. Okay, so now they have both been committed. Um, so NetSIM is all running, and uh, the two L3 VPN services have configured all of the NetSIM devices to support to support those uh, those two services. So the next step is to connect uh, PE0 to a real XR router. So as I've done in the previous example, I've shown you that the the iOS iOS XR device that I was connected to was a XRV9000 router and uh, running software version 7.0.2. So let me go ahead and modify the configuration of PE0. To, uh, to point to the iOS, iOS XR router at this IP address and uh, at this port number. This is the CLI interface of that router. Since this is a fresh router that hasn't yet been configured with any of the service attributes, so uh, the result uh, came back as false when I did a check thing. Um, so the next thing I do, is to run a uh, we deploy dry run. 
check to make sure that uh, the right attributes or configura configuration is being pushed out to, uh, to, to this PE0 device that is connected to a uh, real iOS XR device. So everything looks like it's the same as before. Let's go and do a uh, redeploy. So by pushing out the config to the device, it resulted in, um, in some warning or some error messages coming back from the uh, iOS XR device. It, uh, it looks like the service policy that the service was pushing onto the device isn't being supported, the, uh, the shape uh, average policy. If we go back and look at uh, what got pushed out, policy map, uh, shape average. So since that isn't supported by the device, I'm just gonna go ahead to, uh, to comment it out just to simplify the example. So I've already prepared a, uh, a Rev2 version of the service template, uh, which I have commented out the service policy, and then I copied that Rev2 into uh, into the version that will be loaded into, uh, into NSO. Then let's go ahead and do a packages reload. And uh, the next step is I'm gonna be um, redeploying the two services again. So the two services have been uh, successfully redeployed. So I am now ready to move on to the next step, which is to build a NetConf net. And before I build the NetConf net, the first thing I do is I create a device in NSO and connect that device into the NetConf interface of this same iOS XR router that I have just connected to through its CLI interface. Let's first go ahead and configure a uh, device called PE0-NC is the NetConf uh, interface of that same PE0 device. And the IP address obviously would be the same, uh, but with a, with a different port number. And I am configuring it as a NetConf device with a generic net ID of NetConf. Uh, since I don't have a NetConf net for it yet, I'm using a generic NetConf net ID, which allows me to uh, retrieve the list of Yang models available from the device, as well as to do a guest schema to download the Yang models onto, uh, onto NSO. So when the NetConf net is built later on, I have to come back and update the net ID with the real NetConf net for it. Next, we're gonna be uh, using the NetConf net builder feature of NSO to build the net. In order to do that, we first have to uh, enable the DevTools option. Uh, DevTools is the developer tools, uh, which will then allow me to exercise the um, NetConf net builder commands. So first, we create a NetConf net builder project. Uh, we're gonna name, I'm gonna be naming it uh, Cisco XR Mini, since it's a subset of the YAM models that are supported by the entire device that I will be including in this NetConf net. So I'll call it Mini. And uh, calling it, I'm calling it version 1.0 with the uh, user authentication profile of admin and Cisco as the vendor. So I'll commit it. 
So now that project has been created. And uh, let's look at some project related attributes with the project, the NetCount Net Builder project that we just created. So it shows you the download cache path. This is where all the YAG models downloaded from the uh, device will reside, as well as the net directory path. This is where the NetCount Net will reside when it when it's successfully built. Um, the next step is uh, to to fetch the modules. So this will fetch all of the Yang models that are available from the device. And then we do a, um, a show module command. So I'll scroll back a little bit to show you the command that I typed in, uh, which will show the, um, all of the modules that are available to be, uh, to be selected for me to include into the NetComp Net. So when I, when I previously counted this, there were about 600 total modules available from this iOS XR device uh, and about 250 submodules. So I'm going to go ahead and select the subset of the Yang models that I would like to include in my NetConf Net. Since I already are familiar with this service, so I know which namespaces I should be selecting. Otherwise, if you are interested to, um, to use the full set of YAM models, which perhaps you are going to expand into use cases that will cover those, you are free to select everything when you build your net, or you can use the pre-built one that I've shown in, uh, in the previous demo. So I've selected six modules. Those are the ones that are required to set up uh, the L3 VPN services for this example. Let's do a show of the um, download status. So you see that everything has been uh, downloaded successfully, and you would also notice that there are a lot more modules that has been uh, downloaded than the ones I've selected. The reason being that the ones that my selected modules are dependent on have also been automatically selected to be included in the download. That, that's the default behavior. If you don't want that, you can select uh, no, uh, no, don't select the, uh, the dependence modules. Then okay, now let's go ahead and, uh, and build the net. It's built successfully. If not, it will tell you. So I just exported the net into uh, the slash temp folder. I will go into my uh, terminal screen at the, uh, the command prompt, the shell prompt, and move the net into the packages folder of my project. Now that it's moved, we, uh, it's time to uh, reload the packages again. Okay, it's now successfully reloaded. And you will notice that there's now a NetConf Net package that shows up. And it's the Cisco XR Mini NetConf Net that we just built. And remember I mentioned earlier that uh, after we built the NetConf Net, we have to go back Oops. Did not copy the right commands. So I'll go back into the config mode, and I have changed the net ID now to the NetConf net that I just built, and then I did the synchro and so forth. So now we have a, um, a working NetConf uh, device 
the NSO is talking to. Then the next step is to generate the service template for this NetConf device. So we can, we can use it, you start to use the NetConf interface of this device in, in our service. Let's first undeploy the, um, the service from, uh, from, from all of the devices, because I want the PE0 device to be starting from a unconfigured state. That way, when I perform and we deploy, it will actually push out configuration down onto the device. Otherwise, if it's already configured, nothing will get pushed out, and uh, it would not be uh, very interesting. It would make it uh, make the testing more difficult. And then the other thing to note, uh, to note here is that the service is connected to the CLI interface of uh, PE0, the iOS, the iOS XR router. Um, the NetConf interface is just sitting as an independent node in NSO. When its configuration information is being changed outside of NSO, well, in this case, NSO doesn't know that the two devices are uh, related, so it's almost like as if the changes are made outside of NSO. The configuration information about the NetConf interface of this device would not have gotten updated automatically. So if I do a, um, uh, a compare config, between the two, I would be able to find out the changes that are happening uh, through the CLI interface. So I'll take advantage of that. So now that I have it synced with the, uh, the unconfigured state, I would go ahead and we deploy it. Now this time, the configured parameters will be pushed out to the CLI interface of this XR router. And uh, the information in NSO will also be updated to reflect that. As for the NetConf interface of this device, it still left as in its previous state when we last did the same from, right, which is the unconfigured state. So now if I do a compare config command, and generate the out format of XML. This will give me the XML payload that can be sent to this device via NetConf in order to configure it to have the same configuration information as if the same configuration was done through CLI. Then I can use this information that are within the config tags here in order to um, to generate the NetConf template that are parameterized. In order to easily illustrate to you how that can be done, what I have here are three separate XML files. The one on the left is the raw configuration information that I just captured, right, with the compare config command. And then the one in the middle is the NetConf template, the one that had already been parameterized. And then the one on the right is the CLI template. The reason why I have the CLI template here is that I can reuse the mapping between the variables and the hard-coded values in the configuration data that's already being done for CLI templates and apply the same sort of mapping to the NetConf template. That way, I'm not doing anything from scratch. I can actually just, just just pick out the ones that I can use and just place it into the NetConf template. I'll just show you a couple of examples. So here, the uh, interface name is Gigabit Ethernet uh, with the interface number of 3.77. And if we look across at the CLI template, you see that the ID has these variables being used. And uh, part of the CLI template has Gigabit Ethernet um, as the XML tag. But in the case of NetConf, there's no tag that's called Gigabit Ethernet, meaning that I will actually have to concatenate Gigabit Ethernet as part of the interface 
name with the variables that's being used in the CLI template. That's why you see them being concatenated. The other thing to note that in this example, it makes use of both Java coding and um, service templates. So it will have two kinds of variables, one being used by Java code and the other one being used by the service to um, device mapping. Uh, so that's for the interface name. And then we can also see that the, uh, the Volvo is also a high-coded name. So you see that uh, over here is using the, uh, the slash name variable. And the reason why I know to use slash name is that in under here is also the slash name. And the reason why in some cases you would see that um, some method calls are being used, uh, this is just to make sure that the context node is sitting at the right place after the expression has been evaluated because the structures are slightly different between the NetConf template and the CLI template, they are not all going to be the same after the XPath expression has been evaluated. So those are the only thing that you need to watch out for as you are looking through the list of variables that you can pick from the CLI template. So you go through that process for the entire um, NetConf template and you'll be able to generate the final one. And then the other thing to note here is that I actually removed one of the uh, interface name or interface configuration from this template. Because um, when we do it through NetConf, well, actually, even, even in CLI, since these are different instances, there's no need to repeat them. Uh, we just need one of them. And then the service to device mapping will be able to uh, instantiate multiple instances of it and push those configs onto the device. So let's now go back to the example. And I have a, um, a final version of REF3 of the service template that I've already prepared. So this shows you the NetConf template that we are going to be um, using as the final template. So I've already copied it. So what I can do is I can now go back and do a packages reload. So the reload command succeeded. And at this point, what I would like to do is to unconfigure the PE0 device. That way, again, as I have pointed out earlier, that I always want to start from an unconfigured state on the device. That way, when I do a redeploy, I actually see changes, right, that are being made, as opposed to the configs already existing on the device. That wouldn't be very interesting. So let's go and undeploy the two services. Okay, so both uh, services have been successfully undeployed. Now, in order to change the service to make use of the NetConf interface of PE0, I will first change uh, PE0 to MTR is config. Then at this point, I will be able to change the, um, the net ID and, in, and the device type for it. So I've changed PE0 from a CLI device into a NetCom device now. The reason why I have to empty it, because otherwise NSO wouldn't know what to do with the existing configuration information that is being stored in PE0 that was used by the CLI device type, but now is changing to a NetConf device type. Now we are ready to do a, um, we deploy dry run. Since I previously unneed undeploy it, so now I have a fresh set of configuration that I can push out to, uh, to PE0 as, as can be shown here. 
So if you compare this with the uh, changes that are being made by the COI, then you would notice that the note names are slightly different. So this looks good. We can go and we deploy it. So it has been successfully redeployed. And if you just want to be sure, you can do an undeploy to make sure that that can also succeed successfully. And we do an uh, undeploy. And I can do the same thing with the COI interface of the device, just like how I did it earlier, that, well, that I have NSO connected to both the COI interface and the NetConf interface of this device that would then allow me to sort of compare the changes that will happen through the CLI interface and compare with the original uh, config that was used back in the original example. So that concludes the, uh, the migration uh, process. So as you notice in this example, even though it makes use of Java code, but I didn't have to change it. I believe for those cases that would require changing would be the case when uh, the Java code may be making use of variables that used to be part of a single data element in your Yang model, now maybe got split up into, into multiple or something. Then those would be the cases that you would have to change the Java code. Otherwise, it's a rather straightforward process to migrate from the use of a CLI net to a NetConf net for an existing service application.